Hi, welcome to the Signal Path. In this episode, we're going to take a look at some really interesting S parameter modules from HP from several years ago. These were 75 to 110 gigahertz TR modules used to make S parameter measurements. Even though these are old, at the time, they were absolutely the best you could get. And even now, they are fairly good performance. And it's a little bit difficult to get them to work, but we're going to take them apart and take a look inside and see how we can actually get them to operate and do what we want. But before we get to that, I want to express my gratitude once again to all my Patreon supporters. You guys make these videos possible. The equipment that are used here are thousands and thousands of dollars, even when they're broken. Without you guys, it would be impossible. Even though the Patreon support level doesn't match the amount of money I have to put into the videos, it's still the enabling feature and factor to make these things actually possible. Otherwise, it'd be just financially prohibitive. And to celebrate your generosity once again, I donated $1,250 to One Simple Wish Foundation, which is a foundation that helps children in the United States who are in foster care. Definitely check them out. I'll put a link in the description. But once again, not only are you helping spread knowledge and be able to support the making of these videos, you're also helping some children who would have no other opportunity otherwise. So I'm grateful you guys are really making a big difference across the board. So without any delay, let's get started. So let's take a look and see what we have here. Now, this thing looks like a vacuum cleaner. It's not, of course. This is a TR module from HP that operates between 75 to 110 gigahertz. This is a W-band TR headset, and it can be used to measure as parameters, of course. You would need two of these to do full two-port measurements. Now, this over here is a waveguide WR10. That's the business end, which you point towards the DUT. And of course, the interface of the LO and the RF and the, some of the other IF signals are over here that can be connected to a millimeter wave controller set. Now, without a millimeter wave controller, it's going to be hard to use this, but I'm going to try and see what we can do. But I want to take it apart, show you what's exactly inside, uh, what kind of uh, stuff is used, how do you even build one of these, and how do you make S parameter measurements between 75 and 110 by adding these to an existing network analyzer, in, in the case of a HP 8510. So there's lots and lots to talk about. There's tons of block diagrams and circuits and blo blocks and components I want to look at and see if we can get these things to turn on. Between 75 and 110 gig, you can do some cool experiments because the wavelength is so small, some interesting properties begin to emerge. So I want to take a look at that as well. Now, without keeping you waiting, let's figure out exactly how, what is inside this and how it's supposed to be used in conjunction with a network analyzer. So let's take a look and see how these modules are actually used with a network analyzer in order to extend the frequency of operation. This is how things are done today also. If you want to do some S parameter measurements up to several terahertz, that's what you would do. You would buy frequency extenders which connect to some modern network analyzer to perform these functions. Little really has changed since then, except some additional capabilities are now added where you can do two-tone measurements and even non-linearity and do X-parameter measurements as well. But let's look at this and how what HP was doing back then. So here we have the HP 8510. This is a full-fledged network analyzer by itself. It used to go up to about 50 gigahertz. And even the architecture of this is what has evolved into PNAX, which is what uh, Keysight sells today. You can see at the bottom here, even though it's not very visible, there are two ports and at the back of this module here, that's your S parameter test set. That's where the RF signal comes out of. That's how you would do measurements up to 50 gigahertz. But if then if you had this millimeter wave or this extender module built into it, you would have access to the LO and the RF signals as well as the IF signals directly on there. And you could take those and connect them to these external modules, which one of them I have here in the lab, which we're going to take a look at. And that's how you would extend the frequency range by having access to the LO, RF, and IF. You could connect it to these modules and then measure up to 110 gigahertz. These typically would be banded within the waveguide bands that, that are working with whichever frequency range that's available. So for a WR10, you would be in W band, that would be 75 to 110 gigahertz. That's what we have. And this uh, box of, over here is what c computes all the S parameters, does the calibration, has the data converters in there, accepts the IF signal, and ultimately displays on this little CRT the actual S parameter measurements and the Smith chart or whatever it may be. So how does this actually work? Well, the principal operation, like I said, hasn't changed. So we should be able to easily follow that if you look at the little block diagram here. This block diagram on the left is basically what you see on the right side and we can follow it and see what happens. So here's one of the HP 8510, uh, 8510-04A module. Here's another one. This could be you know, W band, V band. And we have the 8510 system here. Now the 8510 has two sources in it. In one, one of them here is called the LO source and the other one is called the RF source. 
Now, it's going to need those two sources because it has to create a stimulus for the device under test. It also has to have a signal to down convert the reflected signal or the through signal down to an IF frequency the instrument can analyze. Now, you don't want the IF frequency to be at zero hertz. That's why they do an intermediate frequency. In this case, typically about 20 megahertz is used here. So let's see how it works. Well, the RF source is going to be applied through a switch to, let's say, one of these modules. Now, we want this to operate at 110 gigahertz. Now, we can't pass that 110 gigahertz very easily. That would not be a very efficient architecture. Instead, there is a multiplier. This X of N is a multiplier. And this multiplier, in this case, is times 6. So it will increase the frequency by a factor of 6. Remember, these are all single-tone systems. So you're applying a single tone through a multiplier. And the architecture of this, we will take a look at. Now, the issue is that the signal coming out of the multiplier is not leveled. Its amplitude is kind of unknown, and it will change quite a lot during the entire bandwidth of this system. So what they do is that they connect it to a coupler and to a power detector, and they feed that through the ALC port of the RF source back into the RF source. This, form, this forms a feedback. A network between the output power of the multiplier and the output power of the RF generator. So this will automatically level uh, the output here to be a fixed value, which means that the RF's power is going to go up and down as necessary through the bandwidth in order to give a constant power at the sixth harmonic coming from the multiplier. And that's how you get a fixed power. Even though in network analysis you don't have to have perfect a fixed power because the S-parameter calibration routines will take care of that, but you don't want the power to jump up and down by 10 or 20 dB because then your dynamic range continuously changes through the entire range of this and you don't know how much power is going into your device under test, which you don't want. Then there is an isolator. This protects any signal coming back into the multiplier and creating harmonics, so it just creates a very nice clean tone. And then you have your typical couplers. These couplers are present in any network analyzer. This is how you separate and sample the forward path, the incident signal, and the reflected signal into something that then can convert it back into IF. So the signal coming over here will go into the device under test, and then whatever bounces back will come back through the coupler. Or if it goes forward, then it will go through the other ports. Then what you need to do is you need to find your A1 and B1 parameters. Now you can't sample them at RF, that would be silly, it would be at 110 years, but you can down convert them to a fixed IF. So there's two mixers here, and these two mixers are fed now with the LO power. The LO source is at a fraction, once again, of the RF source, and these uh, mixers are now harmonic mixers. So there's no need to multiply the frequency of the LO anymore because the harmonic mixers in turn essentially do that. They do this at the cost of noise figure, of course, but that's the way to do it if you want to build something at 110 gigahertz, especially in the 80s. So now we have the A1 and B1 parameters, which are at 20 megahertz, and then they're fed through amplifiers, and then finally into the 8510 processor for digitization and then computation. That's why there are four of them here, because you need four terms to measure, to compute full two-port S parameters. That's the other two are, of course, coming from the second 85104A module. So if you're, use, if you're doing only S11 measurement, only return loss, then you don't need the other one. But as soon as you do a full two-port network analyzer, you will need both. As you can see, the LO is always applied to both modules simultaneously because you will always need all of these parameters. There's no reason to switch the LO back and forth. But the incident wave that you're generating, the power going into the device under test, is switched back and forth between the two ports and it's not generated simultaneously to the two ports. You certainly wouldn't want that. So that all makes sense then. So it's actually fairly straightforward when you look at it because it's exactly how every network analyzer will operate. And this is how the frequency is extended. Now I also have the block diagram of each of these 85104A modules by themselves. There's a lot more in there than what is shown here, but the fundamental principle is there. But if we go ahead and take a look at the block diagram itself, so here it is. This is a W-band version, W85104A, that's the one we're looking at, the millimeter wave module block diagram. Now the nice thing is that all of the signals that are connected to the cables are actually shown here. So you could technically hack this and play around with it even if you don't have a network analyzer. You might save that for a different video, so I'm not going to destroy the module, but we're going to take a look inside. Here's the LO port. You can see it's going from 2 to 8 gigahertz, so actually it's not at a sixth harmonic. It's much, 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 much higher. <laughs> so that's going to be an interesting thing. And here's the RF going in. This one is definitely at 1 sixth of the power. So let's go ahead and uh, go forward a bit, unless there's a multiplier on the LO port inside, which I have missed. But let's follow 
DRF here. So DRF here is a coax. Go over here, there's a mimic. That's going to do some amplification. You can see these are, by the way, all bias generation and you know all these other things, so we're not going to worry about that. But the RF port here is a mimic that's going to amplify, and here's a multiplier. This multiplier is a doubler. It multiplies it by a factor of two. You can see all of this multiplier bias control over here. This circuitry provides the ideal biasing of this diode multiplication circuit here to give you the highest power coming out of the second harmonic and minimize everything else to balance it out, to eliminate the fundamental feed-through, and so on, and so on. And then after that, we pass that signal forward. Now it says a V-band doubler, I believe this is wrong. This should be a W-band tripler, because the V-band is the one that doubles twice. So the V-band does double and double, that's a factor of four. The W-band does double and triple, that's a factor of six. There's a FET amplifier here, once again, with its own hole. You see this one, it says W-band bias here. This whole uh, circuitry for doing biasing again. And then there is another multiplier and a waveguide filter that is right after it. And that's going to isolate signals from 75 to 110 gigahertz and do a conversion from coax to waveguide because everything up to here is coax. And of course, you don't want to carry that anymore in coax. So that's why you go into a waveguide WR10. You can see the power coming out of here is between 2 to 4 dBm at W1, which is quite significant. Here's our isolator and which is again isolating the multiplier from everything else that's happening after. And here's the coupler and the detector. So some power, a tiny power is stolen from this waveguide piece, put into a detector, which is here shown just by a diode, and the detector signal is taken all the way back here, going through this a single slope logger, whatever the hell they're doing afterwards, passing it all the way back to the network analyzer. And that's how you would do leveling. So the leveling is done at this port right here. So we go forward once again, and what else do we have? Here is our main coupler. Here is the, there it is. This is the main coupler that has the forward and reverse path coupling. Here is the RF port itself. You can see power coming out is between minus two to minus four dBm. So there's quite a bit of loss from here to here. There's a lot of insertion loss from all these waveguides and pieces and couplers and so on. There's two more isolators. You remember these isolators are magnetic components. We, will, we shall see. Take a look at them. And the couplers are coupling. You can see minus two up to minus fourteen dBm. So there's quite a bit. Uh, these are look like they are about, if this is minus 2, minus 2, so this is 10 dB coupling. Going over here, there are the mixers right over here. Here's one mixer, and here's the other mixer. And it looks like these mixers, if this signal is coming in is, uh, as 8 gigahertz, then you can calculate what the harmonic is there. And here's the IF signals coming out. Now, keep in mind that as I showed before, this LO source and this RF source are perfectly synchronized and track each other with a delta of 20 megahertz at RF. So whatever frequency these are need to be at the division, divided ratio are taken into account to make sure that the IF signal coming out of the entire system is kept at a constant 20 megahertz. And that IF signal is then coming all the way back over here and then of course leaves the in instrument over here there it is, and that these RF ports on this connector, our coax connectors, are what carry the RF. That's why they are coaxial, because they are supposed to be protected, so the IF signal is not polluted. As you can see, all the blocks are very nice, and this is going to be built out of individual components, because that's how these things were built back then. Even now, if you want to get the highest quality factor components, these are all individual waveguides pieces, and we shall see. And here's a power divider in there, because the power divider is, of course, required in order to have uh, the two signals going into two mixers simultaneously. But look at the power here. I mean, 21 dBm has to be pushed into here because these two mixers are need about 18 dBm of power at one, uh, what is it, a tenth of the frequency or twelfth of the frequency? Because that's the only way you're going to get the harmonic down conversion to have any conversion at all. That's why these are done this way. There you go. These are, there it is right here. It says, mixers use 14th harmonic of the LO. Woo! The noise figure of these mixers must be horrible. I, I, I wonder what the noise figure of the system is, maybe 40 dB. It's going to be pretty bad. But that's why there's so much power. So the yellow is at the 14th harmonic, whereas the RF is at the 6th harmonic. But everything has to track itself perfectly, and that's for the job of the 8510 in order to do this. So there it is. I explained all of this. I hope you uh, learned something from all this, and you're still listening, because the fun part is now to take this whole thing apart and see what it looks like on the inside. Okay, let's go ahead and take a look and see what's inside this TR module. So I'm going to remove the top cover as well. And here we go. That looks really, really nice. 
Now this is, remember, this was built in the 80s, so we expect all different modules. So we can trace out everything that we saw in the block diagram here. And it should be very easy to follow because it is built essentially like the block diagram suggests. So here's the LO and the RF port. You can see two cables connected to it. One of them is, this is the RF port. The, the purple cable, you see that's a GORE cable, very high quality, very phase stable. The LO cable is a coax semi-rigid cable. Now it's really important that these cables are phase stable because if the phase of them are disturbed after you've done the calibration, the whole calibration is out of whack and then your S parameter results, especially the phase, is going to be completely unusable. This is why they're built the way they are. The same is also true for the IF signal, but the IF is at 20 megahertz. Much easier to get that phase stable. So I'm going to change these cables and remove the really rigid ones because they're hard to work with. But that is not recommended for this to be used in S-parameters. What I have in mind for it is not for a full S-parameter measurement. So I'm going to save these cables so I can put them back in case we ever want to do an actual S-parameter measurement with them. But anyway, not recommended to remove them unless you know why you're removing them and how to put them back. So the LO signal goes into a NARDAR splitter. This is a 3dB splitter. You can see the input and on the other side it's got two outputs. I'll show you that in a second. And the RF goes in here which then enters the main module. So we're going to take a look at that as well and see how that is handled. On this side you can see the output of the TR module here. So this is where the W band signal goes out and then back in for the reflection or for the through measurement. And here's our coupler. This piece you see here. Here's one of the outputs of the coupler. You can see the output of that goes into an isolator. This is a magnetic component, non-reciprocal component. This is really one of the only ways to make a non-reciprocal isolator, a fundamental building block for a lot of full duplex radios, which of course is not integrated. This is not monolithic because it has a magnetic core. A lot of research goes into trying to make something like this in an integrated fashion, in a solid state fashion. Here's a mixer. This is a down convert mixer. Now you probably have seen this before because I've shown you mixers like this and I have a couple of them and I'll show you that as well. You can see it has an RF port and it has an LO and an IF port. And these two ports to the bottom is how the down conversion happens. This is the 14th harmonic mixer. If I turn this, on this side of it you can see the conversion loss of this entire mixer written. As, as just as I expected, you can see it has a conversion loss of about 38, 39 and or 40 even up to 42 dB. So its noise figure is very, very high. But again, that's what you would expect from a 14 harmonic mixer and that's advantage because it has not really, doesn't have any biasing, or at least not any biasing immediately possible. Maybe applied through the IF or the LO port that has been done and can be done through some spectrum analyzers for instance. So over here we can see another isolator. This is where the 110 gigahertz signal is generated. That's the first waveguide output. It goes around through another isolator into the coupler which does power detection. This is how the leveling happens. And when I turn it around you'll see where that signal goes. So it's really not that complicated from the point of view of how the signal flows. So the 110 gigahertz signal goes in here, isolator, leveling, coupler, output. So let me turn it around. This is a pretty unruly. These cables are very rigid and it's hard to play around with. That's how it's supposed to be, of course, for performance and as I explained. There we go. So here's the two outputs of the LO. Once they're split through the Nardo sp splitter, this is a 2 to 8 gigahertz. You can see one of them goes into this mixer and one on the other side. So it has two identical mixers to do the IF uh, at the A1 and A2 parameters of the S parameter, which I already explained earlier. Here's our coupler. Here's the output of the coupler. This is an analog signal which is then fed out back out of the instrument, out of this module, into one of the RF cables in here. You can see there's three. There's the A1, A2, and leveling signal coming out, and all the other pins for biasing and all the other things that I showed you in the block diagram. And if you look carefully in there, which is really hard to see, unfortunately, so we have our RF signal. Where did it go? Here's our RF signal. You can see it goes all the way over here goes into here and there's a module here which does the first doubler and then this module over here does the tripler. So double, triple times six and it ends up in waveguide which then goes into the rest of the circuit. So you can see it's not really complicated. It's got a ton of potentiometers for different kind of calibration and leveling and all, the thing, all these things you need to do. I'm not going to touch any of those. And uh, yeah, this is a proprietary interface of course. So now that we have all of this and we know what's going on inside of it, well, there's a couple of things we can do. We can try and hack this connector and apply our own signals to it, apply RF and LO to it. So see if we can use this as some kind of a TR module and do something interesting with it so you actually see it working and learn something about how to operate it. Of course, I don't have a full 8510 network analyzer and there's no really point getting one of those. It won't really fit in my lab anyway. But I do want to turn this on. So maybe I'm going to go on eBay and see if what else is there that we can 
potentially buy and turn these on. These modules are quite expensive. Even as they are, you wouldn't be able to pick one of these uh, very easily. So that's why the Patreon support is so important. That's, that's how I can bring these things to you guys. So I'm going to go ahead and see what I can find. I don't know if there may, might be a way to actually still operate this. So I went ahead and installed two more flexible cables here for now so we can see if we can do any experiments with it. And here's the mixer I was talking about. And you can see I have a series of them at different frequencies. So this one is a W band mixer. You can see it's WR10. It's the same one that's over here. Uh, this is intended to be used uh, as, a, as a separate piece connected to a spectrum analyzer. When I did the video on uh, the quest to get to millimeter wave, which is the title of the video, where I showed you how we can generate millimeter wave frequencies using a multiplier, I actually went over and showed you how these mixers work. This one you can see has a diplexer already connected to it, which gives it a single port that the instrument spectrum analyzer can use to do down conversion and do a frequency extension. These guys are starting from, let me see what frequency is this one. I forget now. This is 18 to 26 and a half, and then this one ends at 110 gigahertz. So you can see they're waveguide banded. These guys have waveguide to coaxial converter. I go over all of this in that other video, so I recommend that you watch that. So basically, this is one of these. Now, these are pretty expensive. So the fact that this has two of them in there makes this unit really quite pricey, not considering everything else that's in there. So this is a pretty nice instrument already. So let's go ahead. I'm going to go back and, and take a look and see what we can do to see uh, how we can run this. There is a millimeter wave extender box on eBay, which I'm bidding on. So I'm really hoping that I can win that. Uh, those things can become really expensive also, but uh, it seems to be a non-functioning or sold as this kind of thing. I'm hoping that I'm able to pick it up. So let's hope that the next uh, shot is going to be with that instrument. Well, check it out. I did manage to score the 85105A, the Agilent version actually, and this is the millimeter wave controller. Now this one, I think I got it for about $600, which I consider to be a very, very good deal. Now it's not in a very good shape, unfortunately. It's obvious that it's been disassembled by people who are not millimeter wave or microwave experts because they've just ripped the connectors off. In fact, these APC connectors are supposed to look like this, but they have unscrewed them and damaged the threads and actually removed the ends of it because they thought that that's where it separates from the unit. And, and the back, it's even worse. I'll show you. So I want to see if this works, of course, and we're going to take it apart and take a look inside of it, but also we're going to take a look at its block diagram because we need to understand how it works. Since I don't have the rest of the system, we're going to have to make this work on its own uh, without the rest of the 8510 network analyzer, which of course is not present. And then how do we extract the IF signals and what kind of experiments we can do with it is going to be a very interesting. So you can see A1, B1, a2, B2 in a two-port network S parameter representation here. And there's lights here showing you where the stimulus is. Here's for port one, here's a port two. These are the extenders. These are exactly the connectors required for the uh, TR module I just showed you. The module interface, which is a proprietary connector carrying the IF and the leveling signal and the RF and the LO port. Now, this thing is, does not have a synthesizer in it. This is just an interface translation between the 8510 and the TR module I just uh, went over. So this is going to have RF and LO connectors in the back of it, but this is full of components, even though you may think, well, why does it need all of those things aside from a switch? Well, it has a lot of leveling and amplifiers and signal conditioning and control built into it, which we have to see because this also needs to coordinate and communicate with the 8510 when they're all connected together through a GPIB interface or an HPIB interface at the back. So we're going to have to take a look and see what's in the back of it. And this even came with these little attachment, uh, which is used to mount the end of the cable from the TR module to it. Now, we don't really need this, but this is critical for, of course, the safety of the connectors. Not that it matters in this case, but for the safety of the connectors and for a stable S-parameter measurement when the unit is properly being used. But anyway, they've included these and uh, for the two ports. So let's go ahead and take a look at the back and see uh, how bad they have actually done to disassemble it. And here's the back of the unit, and it's a disaster because they've taken wire cutters and have cut these cables. These cables are really valuable because they carry a lot of signals. And it's surprising that they've cut it because all they have to do is unscrew these and pull it, and it just comes off. That's as simple as it is. And they could have sold these cables separately if they hadn't destroyed it in the process of removing this from the rack. This was obviously part of a big setup. And uh, you can see how many connectors are here. This is special HP part uh, that's going to cost a fortune right now if you wanted to buy it. Uh, similarly, for the BNCs, they've done the same thing. That's even more surprising because the BNCs, are, these are really high quality uh, HP BNC cables. And of course, we just remove them very simply. But unfortunately, they have destroyed all of these and we're going to have to take them off. Uh, and these are rigid coax cables, and they have broken them from the connector. Lucky for us, I was looking and I think the connectors themselves have survived. 
Now this has option 050, which means this is a 50 gigahertz compatible version. It can pass the 50 gigahertz signal. These are V connectors. This is a significantly more expensive apart than the one that doesn't have the 050 option because the amplifiers inside and the leveling amplifiers and the switches inside are 50 gigahertz compatible. They're all V connectors and they're basically 67 gigahertz parts. So I'm very happy with this purchase uh, just from that point of view. And you can see this is another one. This one is pretty tight. I'm going to have to use a torque wrench to remove it. But as you can see, there is RF input, RF output, and the LO input. And this RF input output allows it to go back into a, a different module as well. You can see you can put it into S parameter or TR uh, test set mode. I use the GPIB connector and the GPIB address right under there. So it looks really nice. Now we're going to go and look at a, t a block diagram and then open it up and take a look inside and then see if it's in good shape so we can power it on. I don't want to damage anything. But this is most likely being pulled from a working environment uh, because everything is connected to it, which obviously was part of a set. So let's go ahead and take a look at the block diagram. I'm going to remove all of these. And even though this has a propriety connector, I do have a solution for that and I'm going to show that to you as well. So it's going to be very interesting. I'm eager to see if we can get this thing up and running. And here is the block diagram of the 85105A millimeter wave controller. And I really love these HP block diagrams. They did a fantastic job drawing these things out. It's a shame that you cannot do this anymore. A lot of it is because of intellectual property protection. They don't just make these things and make them available for anyone to download. So we can take a look and see what's going on. As I said, this one has option 050, which is a 50 gigahertz option. So the RF input port uh, over here and the RF output port are all 50 gigahertz compatible and this coax switch is now a 50 gigahertz switch which is fantastic and then we have the LO port so we can go with the LO first so if you remember the LO is the 14th harmonic and this one also says here 2 to 8 gigahertz 3 dBm goes in this comes from the 8510 synthesizer itself goes into a power divider over here and it goes into two leveling amplifiers that operate between 2 to 8 gigahertz now you may ask, well, why do you need to go through the trouble of creating a leveling amplifier, which is nothing more than an amplifier in an AGC configuration with a detector at its output. You can see detector over here, coming back over here and adjusting it again. They do this because they want to make sure that the outputs of the LO ports are completely leveled to a, a known power. And this helps because you don't know what your cablings may look like, but you want to make sure that the remote module, the TR module, gets a precise level of the LO so it has a predictable behavior, its conversion losses are all correct, it makes the dynamic range of the S parameter a measurement predictable and known, at least to some extent um, in advance. And then that goes into two ports over here. You can see a low port over here and a low port over here. So the power coming out of here is 22 dBm, very high, as to be expected, because that's what the TR module requires. It itself, as I showed you, does another split in there. So that's where the LO ports are coming from, two identical leveling amplifiers uh, driving it side by side. Now, the RF side is a little bit more complicated because the RF has the option of being internal or external, so that has the input and output. But then once you take that in, it goes itself over an RF amplifier that it also has to have a leveled signal that's precisely controlled because that's being passed again to the RF port and multiplier and so on inside the TR module. Here's another RF amplifier here. This one works, of course, at higher frequencies. And then the output of that has a switch, that switch over here. This switch is the forward and reverse switch. That's how you switch between the two ports. If it's in the forward path, you can port uh, one gets the output. If it's in the other port, the second port gets the output. So the RF is being switched back and forth depending on whether you're doing stimulus on port one or stimulus on port two, whereas the LO is always available as I described earlier. And then there is the uh, leveling circuitry, exactly the same for that. Now, what is also really nice that's present in the millimeter F controller is this block over here. It means that the IF that's generated and is fed back from the TR modules, uh, the both of them, so the parameter A1, B1, A2, and B2, these guys over here, they are amplified by a 30 dB IF amplifier matched uh, quad. And that means that we can use this by itself just so that we can amplify the IF. Now, if this works, I might be able to just build a radar out of it. I can build a millimeter wave radar, which is has all the building blocks over here. So that's going to be an interesting experiment if, if everything works. And there are some further switches here. You can see there are lots of IF switches. And the reason the IF switches are here is because you have these two ports connected at the back and there needs to be some way of the rerouting the IF into different ports and this has to do with how it communicates with the rest, rest of the 8510. So lots of really interesting things in this. The rest of it is a microprocessor 
over here, which communicates with the HPIB at the back. There's summing, summing amplifiers which allow you to feed things back and forth and bypass them if the millimeter wave head is not being used. There are some LEDs here that indicate uh, which port is being driven and whether it's doing forward or reverse and all of this is controlled by the HPIB uh, interconnect and that is controlled by the 8510 itself. So there's a lot of circuitry down here which unfortunately we can't control immediately unless I find out what HPIB commands can switch this which I haven't been able to find looking at this maybe one of you guys know those commands but anyway we will explore this as we go forward but as you can see everything in this box is quite valuable and quite critical for S parameter measurements and this allows us to interface nicely with these modules without having to worry about hacking the connector or figuring out how the connector works. So now that we know what's in there, we can go back to the 85105A, which I think yeah, there we go, we can go back to this and take it apart and see all these different things inside and make sure it looks nice, make sure the power supply looks nice so we can power it on. I'm very eager to see if we can drive it somehow externally and get some cool experiments out of it. So let's go ahead and take a look inside of this millimeter wave controller. It's really nice, everything's really spaced apart. That's because they had really no space constraint when they designed this. This had to fit in the same 8510 chassis, so they had lots of room to work with. They didn't also design and redesign or uh, configure anything specifically for this. They used off-the-shelf components or their own modules from different instruments and all put it all together into one chassis. Even the power supply is broken into two because they already had a power supply module specifically to drive uh, one of the amplifiers, so they just replicated the transformer directly going into it avoiding all the extra design of a new power supply. Here's the other transformer going into another power supply module, and this power supply module goes into the main chassis motherboard, which is underneath this whole thing. You can see a little bit of it down here. That distributes the power to everything else. So let's go ahead and follow some of the signals and see what happens. We can start with, let's say, the LO signal. We know the LO signal has to be present on both ports simultaneously, regardless of what measurement you're doing. So there has to be some parallel, basically, amplifier section to drive the LO ports. So the LO comes over here. That's this wire right over here, which is right now connected to this blue cable. And that goes into a Nardo power splitter. And that is going to work between 2 to 18 gigahertz or so. And that gets split into two simultaneous leveling amplifiers. You can see two identical blocks over here. Here's the leveling amplifier itself, here's the biasing detector over here, detector over there, and the two outputs of these and this go into the front LO ports of the unit. So that means that this path is always active as the LO is applied so that you can have LO on both of these, as I explained in the block diagram that's needed, no matter what S parameter you're measuring. Now the RF is a little bit different. RF coming in over here from this cable goes into this electromechanical switch. This is a 50 gigahertz version of the instrument, so it's going to have a millimeter wave electromechanical relay here, which is going to basically let it bypass back out from the other connector over here, which nothing is connected to, allowing you to send the LO to a different uh, module in the entire rack. The output coming out then goes into a, another amplifier. There's only one of these amplifiers that's for to doing the RF portion. Now, this one does not have an electromechanical relay because remember, the RF is not applied to both ports simultaneously. So it needs to switch back and forth every time you do a sweep between uh, the wave being uh, present at channel one versus channel two. Now, instead of an electromechanical relay, it uses a pin dial switch, and that's to be expected because you don't want a, a relay clicking back and forth every time you want to switch between the four ports. Not only is, is it going to age horribly quickly and basically stop working, it's also going to be fairly slow between the switches. That's why they use a pin diode, putting up with the losses and the difficulty of that is well worth it for an application like this. And this is normal for any network analyzer. So then once those are done, the reflected waves coming back are going to be at IF, and those need to basically be amplified and sent back out of the unit, so that those would be the parameter A and B on both of the ports, so A1, B1, a2 and B2 need to go back, but they need to be amplified. So you can see the four of them going into this amplifier section here. This is a quad 30 dB amplifier I showed you. So it's going to have four outputs that go into this selector switch. That selector switch is going to reroute the IF into two of the ports at the back, depending on where this is sitting in the stack. If it's sitting in conjunction with a regular uh, submillimeter or millimeter a uh, switch box, then it has to go to that first, and then that's going to route IF into the digitizer portion. So that's what these selector switches are. That's why you have so many of these orange cables, because you have two parallel paths, depending on how the IF is routed. So the IF going over here and then going into the switch. All of this and all the configuration and the power supplies and the selections and the pin diodes and the mechanical drivers, all of that is controlled by this GPIB card. This GPIB controller 
is plugged into the main motherboard and controls all of these from all the wires that you see. It also controls where the IF goes, and here's the connector to the GPIB, which goes to the back. Now, here's the problem. This is not intended to be operated by itself. In fact, there is absolutely no documentation that I could find after a long time of searching, even calling a uh, keysight, that tells you what the HPIB commands are to turn this thing on and off. Because when you turn it on, it's inactive. All the amplifiers are off, all the relays are off. There's nothing you can do. There is no signal that you can apply here that will show up here. And the IF is not going back. So this is completely useless when you first turn it on, unless it is being controlled by the 8510 a network analyzer. So I have to find a way to reverse engineer it and find out what those GPIB commands are so I can run it on its own. Otherwise, there's nothing we can do with it. So there's a couple of ways we can go ahead. If I had a whole 8510 stack, I could spy on the GPIB bus and find out what commands are being sent. That's one way. The other way is I'm going to remove this, and this thing has an, a, a UV erasable EEPROM on it. That means that the commands of the microcontroller that's on there to control the whole thing is in there somewhere in the assembly code, or I should say in the, in the machine code, because it's, an, a, it's a, a essentially a binary file at that point. So we could try and reverse engineer a code that's directly in here to find out what those commands are. So those are two ways to explore. But without doing that, we basically have nothing. So we're slowly getting forward, though. And if you remember, the connectors in the front of this were all broken. So I went ahead and changed them to new connectors. And I'm going to show you. The connectors are actually quite a bit nicer than what it was originally even shipping from HP. What I put on it are, are much higher quality connectors. And uh, they're very, 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 very expensive. Uh, so we're going to take a look and see how, how that looks like as well. But you know, we're getting closer one step at a time. So let's go ahead and take this out and see what it looks like. And here's the GPIB controller. So things are fairly straightforward. There's a GPIB controller IC over here. Here's the EEPROM I was talking about. Motorola 68000 processor, so it's very straightforward to do a potentially a decompiler and disassembler directly on this and find out what is going on with those instructions. And that's going to be, it's not as easy as I'm making it sound because you don't know where the beginning and the end of some of these instructions are. So that needs to be figured out. Everything else is uh, nothing unusual, some dip switches for doing some configuration. I played around with it a little bit, but there wasn't anything conclusive I can get from it. So that's it. That's, that's basically the next step. We have to figure out what those commands are. So let's go and see what that bin file looks like, and hopefully it will be in a step in the right direction. So here is an example of what that bin file inside the UV raisable EEPROM actually looks like. So there is a, obviously a ton of data in there. But scrolling along, you can see some familiar things, like some of the specifications of different units that are all captured here. You can see HP 8514A, and you can see this revision is written, and all the different settings are in there. So it's obvious that that information is embedded in this bin file. Now I went around and tried some disassemblers, and after a lot of searching and looking around, eventually I found out a couple of the commands which may actually be relevant. So what we have to do is now we have to connect the GPIB controller to it, connect that to the USB port, and send some of these commands and see if we can get the unit to do anything. But yeah, there's a ton of stuff in there, and of course, this you, ha you don't know where the, the beginning and the end of this file is, but we know it is compiled for a particular processor, and that helps us to do a disassembly on it. So I'm not going to bore you with the detail of that. It's just a lot of tedious work trying to figure it out and reverse engineer. What's interesting is some of the commands that I have found, if they would do anything uh, once we connected the unit. So let's go ahead and give it a try. And here's the front of the instrument. After the repairs I've done to the connectors, you can see very nice, high-quality connectors there. I've connected it to the external uh, module there, the TR module, but of course this is not going to do anything because the active light is turned off and we don't have A1 or A2 lit, so which means that there is no RF and there is no LO that's being routed to the front of the unit. But I'm going to try a couple of GPIB commands. Let's see if we can get this to turn on. So here's the first command I had. Now setting this did nothing. But I do have another command I also found, and check it out. There it is. We can actually activate the whole unit. So now we have port 1 activated, the whole LO amplifier section, leveling amplifier sections, everything's on. I even found out how to switch it to the other one. But we don't need it because I've just terminated these. Right now we're only using one of them. But now that I know the commands to turn these back and forth, this opens up a whole lot of other opportunities. Maybe we can even build an S-parameter set out of this using some of the other modern network analyzers and configure it ourselves. Well, having said that, let's see if we can generate something above 100 gigahertz using the external multipliers that we have. So let's take a look at our setup. Now, there's going to be a lot of instruments involved in order to generate all the necessary signals and to analyze the things that are coming back from the TR module. So I'm going to walk through it so you can see what's going on. 
First of all, we're going to need two sources that are locked to each other because we need a source at one sixth of the frequency to generate DRF, and we need a source at one fourteenth of the frequency to down convert DRF into an IF signal. Those two sources have to be 20 megahertz apart at the fundamental, which is the RF output. So here I have one source. I've set this source to 17.50333 gigahertz. If you multiply it by 6, you get 105.02 gigahertz. That's going to give us our fundamental frequency at 105.02 gigahertz. Now we need another signal that's at the 14th harmonic to generate a down converted signal at 105 gigahertz. So I'm going to use the Agilent uh, N5230A, which is a network analyzer, to generate a CW tone at 7.5 gigahertz. And I've done a repair video on this guy, a repair video of that guy, on those guys, so you can go and check all those repair videos and see what's inside this unit. So we get a 7.5 gigahertz signal here, and a 17.5 gigahertz signal here. Now we need to amplify these and level them to a constant about 6 dB. Uh, amplitudes that we can fit into the unit that makes things nice and easy so we don't have to worry about you know the uh, power coming out of the network analyzer everything's just going to be nice and balanced so we're connecting it to two amplifiers here this is 8349b two of these you can see the powers are written there and that's going to generate our R R lo and rf signal those two signals are going over here and being fed into this unit of course now, the output of this unit, after it's been configured with GPIB, is going to be the LO and the RF going into the multiplier unit. And that's sitting all the way out here. I'm going to show you that in just a second. Having said all of that, the ultimate goal is to be able to see if we actually have generated a 105 gigahertz signal. So for that, I have connected an external mixer directly to the output of the TR module. You can see the external mixer over here. We've got the diplexer at its output. I've talked about this in detail as well. And that goes finally into our spectrum analyzer. And if you look, check out what we have. There is our signal at 105. 0.02 gigahertz. Its amplitude is about minus 9 dBm. I haven't taken all the losses out properly, so it's probably a little bit, a couple of dB more, which is very close to what its specification says it should be. So we actually have a 105 gigahertz signal that matches perfectly to what we expect. Now I can move that tone around. That's not difficult to do because all I need to do is to change the frequency of this synthesizer here. You can see it's set to 17.50. 3, 3. I just need to change that in order to change the RF frequency. So now that we have seen all this setup, that's great. We can generate a tone, but what we wanted to do is to see if we can get a down conversion actually happening and see if we can do some rough S parameter measurement or at least some reflection measurements. So now I'm going to have to change the setup and figure out if we can extract the IF signal. The goal is to put that into the oscilloscope at the very top there and see the 20 megahertz signal, which is the result of the mixing of the two RF and LO inside the TR module. So there's a lot going on here, and there's a lot of equipment happening going on, but we should be able to make uh, some experiment using this directly. So let me set that up. Now that we know that we have this, I can just take this guy off and see if we can do some other experiment with it. Normally, you're supposed to screw this, but for now, it's OK. All right. Let's see if we can get some IF happening in this. And here is the setup of our final experiment. So I've got everything working together now. And what we've made essentially is a CW radar. And we can make the radar even more complicated, make it FMCW or pulse or some other type. But this allows us to do something neat because we're working at millimeter wave frequencies. We can make extremely precise distance measurements using millimeter wave signals. So I already explained what's going on on the right side there with all the sources connected. Right now I'm running the system at 84 gigahertz, but really it doesn't matter. The previous setup was at 105 gigahertz. So everything that I said before is valid. We're applying the RF and the LO into the multi millimeter wave module, but now we also added some other thing to the output, and I want to show you that close up. So here's the addition to the output. So we verified that indeed we can generate millimeter wave signals coming out. So right now I have 84 gigahertz coming out of over here into this horn antenna. And this horn antenna transmits to the surface of this metallic piece and therefore there will be some signal reflected back into the horn. Now remember that the module itself has a coupler, which means that we can measure the parameter A1 and B1 directly from here being fed back onto the millimeter wave controller. We can collect that from the back of that other unit, which means that I can measure the incident wave, which is the power of the signal going forward. I can also measure the reflected wave, which is the power of the signal coming back. I actually can get a vector measurement in this case, because we can look at the sinusoid all on the oscilloscope at the 
same time. Remember that the whole system is coherently locked to each other, meaning that there is a phase relationship between the forward signal and the reverse signal. If that phase information wasn't there, you wouldn't be able to do S parameter measurements in the first place. That's the beauty of this TR module. So why is that an interesting experiment? Well, if you think about that, the forward wave has nothing to do with what's at the output here because it doesn't even see this horn antenna. The forward wave is collected at the coupler inside the unit. But the reflected wave is going to have a phase which depends on the distance between this horn and this metal piece over here. Which means if I change this distance by playing with this micrometer, I can move this back and forth in a very, very minute way and I can measure exactly how far this goes back and forth. Why? Because the wavelength at 84 gigahertz in free space is tiny, right? We're talking about at 30 gigahertz is 10 millimeters, so at 90 gigahertz is about 3 millimeter. So the wavelength is only a few millimeters, meaning that if I move this by a few millimeters, I will be able to cover 360 degree of phase shift at 84 gigahertz. Now this is really valuable because I can measure tiny distances by looking at the relative phase of the incident wave compared to the reflected wave. So basically I'm using this TR module for S parameters, I'm turning it into a CW radar. So let's go ahead and see that if that's actually working. So again, I just want to make sure that that is very clear. The forward wave is captured here. The reflected wave is going to be a function of this whole distance and this variable distance which I control. We can look at both of the A1 and B1 parameters on the oscilloscope. That's all going to be exactly at 20 megahertz because that's how all the LOs and RF have been handled to each other. So if I go over here at the back of the unit, I took that cable that was cut out and I retrofitted it into some SMA cables like this. So now we can actually look at the signal directly from the back of the unit. So even if I close the unit completely, I don't need to access anything inside. Everything is taken at the back. So there it is. Now it is fully functional. Let's go ahead and see what the oscilloscope says. And here are two waveforms on channel one, which is yellow. I have the incident wave and on channel two, blue, or channel three, blue, I have the reflected wave. And I'm also plotting them versus each other. As we can see, I've already lined them up so that they are exactly in phase. The amplitude is going to be different, of course, because we don't have the same amount of power on the forward and reflected wave. It's part of the reflected wave travels through free space, which is exactly what we're trying to measure. So now we can go ahead and try and see if this makes any sense and if we can measure the wavelength of the uh, RF signal coming out at 84 gigahertz by moving the micrometer and moving the reflected plane. Now the only thing you need to consider is that the amount of displacement is going to be half the wavelength. So I'm going to adjust the wavelength until the blue with respect to the yellow goes 360 degrees. Whatever number that is in distance, we have to multiply it by two and that's the wavelength of light or wavelength of RF signal at 84 gigahertz in free space. So we can go ahead and try that. I'm gonna turn the micrometer and see what happens. So as I turn it, um, here's the plot versus each other. You're gonna see a line here, of course, because they're perfectly in phase. I'm going to turn the micrometer here. There it is, you can see the wave is moving with respect to the other one. Now they're 90 degrees apart. I'm going to continue. There it is, 180 degrees apart, 270 degrees apart, and I'm going to bring them perfectly aligned to each other. There it is, so that was 360 rotation. Now we can go to the micrometer and see if that makes any sense, and indeed we measured the correct wavelength at 84 gigahertz. And at the same time, I've put the uh, mixer there on the ground right next to it. It's just a bit of a leaking power onto it, so we can see we indeed have uh, 84 gigahertz as our wavelength there. So it's really all working together. Let's go and take a look at the micrometer. Zoom in as much as possible. There it is. Now if you look closely, you can see that the displacement is, here it is, a zero that would be one, one millimeter there is about 1.75, maybe 1.8 1 millimeter total displacement. That's of course twi half the wavelengths because there's, it bounces off, that's twice the distance. That would mean that the wavelength should be somewhere around 3.6 millimeter, which is exactly what it's supposed to be. The free space uh, wavelength at 84 gigahertz is 3.57 millimeter. So it all works out perfectly. And here's the mixer I was saying that there's some leakage power uh, from the horn here that just makes it direct into the waveguide opening. You can detect that because there we've got fairly good displayed average noise level to see that. But there it is. As you can see, it's a really complicated setup. There's a lot of stuff going on here, but hopefully by the end now, you can see how everything works together and what a beautiful experiment here we have set up. 
and of course Pooch is always um, making sure everything's taken care of. But there it is. That's the beauty of fixing a lot of equipment and a lot of Patreon support, of course, and bringing all these wonderful experiments to you. And I hope that you enjoyed that. And, and uh, le leave some comments and let me know what you think about all of this. There's a lot of other experiments we can do, FMCW radars we can do. As always, your Patreon supporters are amazing. This is what the result of all of uh, nice work that you've done being able to create these cool videos for you guys. So I'm going to try and see what else I can do with this. There's a uh, th uh, there's another one of these remote heads that I might be able to get a hold of and then we can actually do through transmission and then the coolest thing would be to retrofit this and hook it up to a another network analyzer maybe even the one over here by f uh, finding a way to do the calibration and actually perform you know 75 to 110 gigahertz um, network analysis directly on these devices that we have so I hope you enjoy that I'll see you in the comment section